I want to talk to you guys about first love this morning. We're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about relationships. But everything begins and ends with the relationship and the connection that we have with God the Father. And so I want to first look unto God. There's a lot to be said about first love, but when I think, when I think about it, I often think of that really awesome relationship that you have with your spouse, right? When you, had, when you first started dating and you were in, my dad calls it the buck in the rut. If you, guys are <laughs> if you guys are like hunters or anything like that, like a deer will do stupid things when it's time for breeding season. Like they'll just get out there. Like normally they're super like, you know, skittish and looking around. But when it's time, like for breeding season there, this buck's just like, just walking. He's looking, at, he's looking right down the gun and like kind of nuzzling it away. Like doesn't even care. We just do silly, silly things. I am not the type of person that rides a Greyhound bus. And I don't have anything against people that do ride the Greyhound bus. I've just never really found a proper place on that bus. I went on there one time when Lauren and I had first started dating. We lived about two and a half hours away, away from each other. And she would drive down uh, every once in a while and come over on the weekends and stay with my family. And then every once in a while, I'd go up there and stay with her family. And there was just one weekend where she's like, man, you know, it's cold outside. I really don't want to do this drive alone a little two and a half hour drive. Like, we live in Prosper. You almost have to go like an hour just to get to a decent restaurant half the time anymore. But she's like, I don't want to do the two and a half hour ride. I'm like, no problem, baby. I love you. And so I hop on a Greyhound bus. And it's everything I had been afraid of in my life. Like, I go to the very back of the bus, which means I'm sitting on the seat that is right above the engine. So it's cold. I get these whiffs of like, horrible engine heat. To my left is a rather large, sweaty man that is falling asleep on me. And then to my right is, I don't know why they put a bathroom on a Greyhound bus, but the smells that were coming forth from that thing needed to be cast out of that bus. That was not made of man. There was something demonic wafting from this side. There was heat coming up from underneath, and there was a big sweaty dude sleeping on me from the left, and that was two and a half hours of my life as I go and ride through the night to be picked up by my father-in-law at one in the morning just so I could get back in the car with Lauren no less than eight hours later just to ride back to my house. I wish I could say today I would do that with Lauren, but I'm like, baby, I will FaceTime you like as long as you want, but I am not getting on a Greyhound bus to come over there and hang out. But first love, man, that's that crazy love. That's that love where you just say, whatever you want, honey, I just want to be close to you. I just want to hold your hand while we drive down Highway 20, getting over there to East Texas. It's just, we silly, we silly. But Revelations 2 and verse 2 Going out to verse 5, it says, I know your deeds. Jesus is saying this, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. Come on, he's saying that you've done a lot of good things on the outside. You're calling sin, sin. You're fighting through the hard times. You're leaning into truth. And yet, look at verse 4. He says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Verse 5, he says, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand." from this place. Next week, I'm going to break that verse down, those verses down for us. But understand, this is the heart of the Father. He's saying you're doing a lot of good things. He says in another portion of scripture, he says, you are going to do good deeds in my name, but I have this one thing against you. He says, we do not have first love. You have to depart from me because I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. I'm not just interested in the acts. Like, yes, faith without the works, it's dead. And so we want to see action. Like, if you really do believe this, it's going to show out in your life. But if you're just doing the things and you do not have the relationship with the one who has called you, who has created you, who wants to have that relationship with you, he said, you're missing, you're missing the point. Return back to first love. The word of the Holy Spirit to us for 2022 has been the year of return and rebuild return back to the heart of the Father and rebuild the relationship with you that you have with him. If you're going to live a life that invites others to embrace Jesus, you're going to have to learn how to show the love of God 
to the world around you, to those that agree with you and to those that don't agree with you, to those that love you and to those that hate you. You have to have the love of God, and the only way you can do it is by spending time with him, not just on Sunday mornings, but each and every day. So we're going to talk about first love this, this, this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 17 and verse 11. And if you guys have been a part of this house for any time, I know we've only been here since last August, but by now you should know that we love to stand and honor the reading of God's word. So when you find Luke 17 and verse 11, I want to invite you to stand with me. It says, Now on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee, and as he was going into the village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go and show yourselves to the priest. As they went, they were cleansed. One of them, come on, somebody say one of them. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was, found, uh, he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner. Then he said to them, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Holy Spirit, we want to be a people that say, me too, whenever you're pouring out blessings, Lord God. Whenever you are doing anything in the room, I want to be a person that says, me too, Lord God. And then when I get the blessing that I so desperately need or want in my life, let me not just go run and take it and enjoy it for myself, but God, let me be the one that turns back and says, thank you, the one that acknowledges you as master, as Lord, as healer, as the keeper, as the foundation, as everything that I need. Let me look towards you, the author and the finisher of my faith. Let me look towards you, the one where my help comes from, Jesus. Remind us of who you are and let the revelation knowledge of who you are bring us back to your feet and cause us to give praise and glory and honor unto your name. Not just on Sundays, Lord God, not just on Wednesday nights at the prayer nights, but God, each and every day day. Let us be a people that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Let, a peop, let us be a people that say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Amen, amen, amen. You guys may be seated. What you recognize in this, and this is so true of life, that people can all have the exact same encounter, but experience something completely different. All these guys got this amazing miracle, but the experience was completely different. If you're going to talk, hey. <laughs> if you're going to talk about leprosy, Anybody had leprosy in the room? No. We don't, have, <laughs> we have, we don't deal with leprosy nowadays. Uh, so I think if you're going to talk about leprosy, you should at least kind of define it, bring everybody up kind of to, a, uh, to an even, even page here. So what was leprosy? We could go into detail about the, just the grotesque disease that this thing is. I mean, it would have issues with their skin, limbs are falling off, the bird's heads are falling off, like there's all kinds of stuff that's going on, like in the bodies of these people, but there's two things that I want you to really take note when we talk about leprosy. Number one, in the Jewish culture, it was looked at as a divine consequence. This wasn't just like you got a cold because you were playing out in the rain, that what they find throughout Old Testament and New Testament is there was plenty of times where people would sin and the response from God was this specific sickness. One of the most iconic stories in my mind of this is when Aaron and Miriam are speaking against Moses. This is Aaron. He's got a high status there in Israel as the priest. This is Miriam. She's a prophet. And they're looking at Moses, who's taking it to a whole other level, and they're saying, why do we have to follow him? Can't we hear God just like he hears God? And what I love in this story is that God's like, actually, no. He's like, you know, when I speak to the prophets, I speak to them through dreams and visions, but when I speak to my servant Moses, I talk to him. Can't even imagine this. He says, I talk to him face to face as one that is my friend. And then he immediately strikes Miriam with leprosy. And Aaron looks and he's like, oop, <laughs> we messed up. <laughs> he knew because this is one of the things they would do. When they got the leprosy, they would go, not to a physician, but they would go to the priest to be checked out. And he knew exactly what had happened. They had spoken against the servant of the Lord, and immediately Miriam is struck with leprosy, and Aaron has to ask for forgiveness on her behalf because that was the position of the high priest there. And so God heals her, and then she gets to go sit in timeout for a couple days thereafter. But this was something that 
kept showing up in Jewish tradition. So it wasn't just any normal sickness. What we can understand about these 10 men is they were under this attack because of a life that they had lived. The second thing that's important to understand about leprosy is that it was a disease that caused you to grow numb where you could no longer feel pain. And a lot of the ways that people would die is they would like, they'd be sitting on a coal or they'd be getting cut or doing something and not realize it because they're not feeling anything anymore. And if we can bring this into our lives, a lot of times what happens in the area of sin, the thing that really kills us, the thing that brings the separation between us and God, it's not that how many times can I sin before I lose my salvation. It's that a lifestyle of sin brings you to a place where you just grow numb to it. Have you ever just gotten to that place? I hope not where you just say, it's like, it's not a matter that God wouldn't forgive me anymore, it's just that I'm tired of saying I'm sorry. Because I know that tomorrow I'm going to do it again. Let us not waste the pain of our sin. Let us not grow comfortable in saying, I can fight through this. I realize that it hurts, but I'm strong enough. I'm bullheaded enough that I can push on through. Can we connect with these lepers in this way this morning that we don't want to come to that place of numbness in the spirit where it's like, I'm not, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry anymore. Let your pain push you to a place where you say, God, I surrender all to you and discover the freedom and the love of the forgiveness of the Father. So point number one is the condition. This is the condition of leprosy. It's a numbness within our lives that causes us to just push away from the Father. Number two is the community. Leviticus 13, 6, 30, 46 says, as long as they have the disease, talking about leprosy, as long as they have the disease, they remain unclean and they must live alone. How many times has sin caused us to move to a place of isolation? I don't want to come to church. I don't want to talk to my spiritual authorities because I don't want to deal with the problem anymore. It says they must live alone. They must live outside the camp. What would happen in that culture is if they went into the community uninvited, they would receive 40 lashings. As they stood outside the camp, they weren't even really supposed to be around any other lepers. Isolation was the name of the game, and if anybody even came close to them, they just had to scream out, unclean, unclean, unclean. And yet, the community that Jesus was desiring was to say, go and be the church. Go and find those who have been set aside. Go and find those who are cast out and let them know that there is a better way through Christ Jesus. In Luke 10, verses 1 through 2, Jesus would do this. Notice this. He says, after the Lord appointed 72 others, he would send them out two by two ahead of him in every town and place where he was about to go. And he would tell them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. So Jesus's business model, you could say, is I'm heading over to Prosper. What I need to do is I need to send Tyler and Ray over there. And then our job is we got to go find the proper location. We got to start spreading the word and letting people know what's about to happen. Let them know that Jesus is coming, get the provisions, get what's going to need to be needed for that moment. Jesus would send them out because he didn't just say, well, maybe the Holy Spirit will just work it out for us. You know, he was strategic in the way that he would go and do ministry. And you see this strategy at work here because these lepers who were not allowed to be in the community that weren't even supposed to be close to one another knew that Jesus was coming. And I really believe that it was because these disciples were going out and they were doing the work that they need to do. Come on, when I tell you guys that we need to be the people that live a life that invites others to embrace Jesus... The heart of the intercessor is not just Jesus, 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 bring them into the four walls of our church so they can join our little club. The heart of the intercessor is God, strengthen me and send me out into this world around me to be light in the darkness. I love it. I was talking um, with somebody at the end of prayer on Wednesday. And it was like, it was so profound, but it was so simple at the same time. He's like, you know what we need to do? Like, we're going into these neighborhoods and we're praying at these different houses. Like, we should just probably check with the people on our streets and see like, Anybody need prayer around here? Most people won't like just shut you down if you say, I want to pray for you. Every once in a while you might get one. But for the most part, you're like, bro, can I pray with you? Yep, okay. You know, some, take some prayer requests down. Like just connect in your community just in a very simple way. It's not super aggressive. You're not asking them to do anything other than just bring a request before the Lord. And how many believe that God is looking for ways to reveal himself to the world around us? And he wants to do it through us. He wants to do it through us. He's, it's not just like something that just kind of pops out of thin air, but he's enacting it through us as we obey him. He's sending people out. He's sending us out, God. Here I am, Lord. Send me to go be your hands and feet in our communities to see the change that we want. You see the fruit 
of descending in verse 12. He says, as he was going into the village, brother didn't even make it into the village before these 10 men who had leprosy met him and they stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, master, have pity on us. Master, have pity on us. And again, I just want to reiterate that we are so excited about the breakthrough and the overturning of Roe v. Wade. But at the same time, in every issue, in every debate, there are always going to be those who find joy and celebration in what's being done. There's those who are hurting and feel more alone than ever. Wherever you find yourself in that debate or any other debate, and as we move forward as a community, our goal is to run right down the middle and say, I'm here to help you, and I'm here to help you, and I'm going to bring you together through the cause of Christ. Because before I'm an American, before I'm anything else, I'm a child of God. Before anything else, we're going to get to live here for about 70, 80, maybe 100 years, but then we have the rest of eternity to live our lives. And so what I want to do is I want to push back past our differences and say, let me draw you to the one that is your help, that is your comfort, that is your peace. Can we move past indifference and say, I want to show you the love of Christ because that's what Jesus does. Psalms 34, uh, verse 18, it says, the Lord draws near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. You see, he didn't just say, lepers get away, I'm coming over here for these folks. But before he ever even connected with the people that he was walking towards, he saw those who were brokenhearted. Number three is the cure. In Luke 17, verse 14, it says that when Jesus saw him, he said, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. I just believe a word for each and every one of us this morning, myself included, is that we need to come to a place where we participate with the miracle that God is wanting to do in our lives. Come on, can I tell you again? You need to participate with the miracle that God is wanting to do in your life. That so many times we can get in this passive posture of just, I'm in my prayer closet, I'm down on my knees, I'm proclaiming the word. Can I tell you, I love that. I do that on a daily basis. I believe there is power in that, but if it stops right there, you're missing the blessing of the Lord in your life. You're just getting the tip of the spear there almost in some ways because the word says that as they went, they were cleansed. That it was actually the obedience that brought about the healing in their life. It wasn't just calling out to God and saying, God, heal us. It was, again, like what you see so many times throughout the word, is Jesus says, you've asked for the miracle. I'm willing to give it to you. This is what I want you to do. And this is not a posture to say that God helps those who help themselves. Because most of the time, and I think this is where we miss it, is that we seek after God and Holy Spirit says, okay, I've heard your prayer and I want to bless you in this area and I want you to go do this. And when you hear it in the natural, you're like, too simple. Like, I was expecting it to be something super dramatic. I mean, consider Moses. He's got the whole nation of Israel behind him, and he's coming up towards the Red Sea. God doesn't give him some amazing strategy on how he's going to build a boat or how he's going to build a bridge or some alternate route. He just says, I just want you to come and do this. I just want that sign of surrender. I just want you to raise your hands up towards the water. This, if I go out to Lake Louisville and do this right now, all I'm going to do is get a sunburn and air out my armpits. But when it's done under the obedience and the command of the Lord, the water split back, the ground becomes dry, because they were traveling with a lot of people. It wasn't just enough that the water supernaturally receded. They had to have some good dry ground to go across. They go across it. But not only that, that same blessing that was a blessing for Israel became the demise of Pharaoh and his army, all because one man said yes to the direction of the Lord. Story of Naaman, same story. Just go dip in the dirty old Jordan River and this leprosy will be taken care of. And he fought it because it was like, no, 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 that seems too easy. And he had to have somebody alongside of him to say, you know, if he asked you to do something hard, you would have been happy to do it. Or how about Joshua? Joshua sees the angel of the Lord, and I love this. He goes, are you for us or are you with us? Are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? And he's like, I'm neither. And then he declares who he is. And next thing you know, Joseph, Joseph doesn't have his, uh, or Joshua doesn't have his shoes on anymore, and he's down worshiping before the Lord, and he's being given instructions. And once again, it doesn't make sense in the natural. It's just something simple. All I want you to do is walk around the city, blow your trumpets every day. Then on the seventh day, I want you to scream real loud and blow some trumpets. Screaming and trumpet blowing was like a normal thing in the midst of battle, but when it's done in obedience to the word of the Lord, it drops the walls down in your life. Come on. Guys, sometimes it's just about that simple obedience. The other thing I want you to see here in the cure is that we need to be a people that are never satisfied. 
I know this might sound a little counterintuitive. It might even sound a little ungrateful, but I want you to lean into the reality that you serve a God of more. And so even when you get something good, don't believe that it's like, oh, good, I got my thing. Let me go and enjoy my life. That's just the tip of the spear. That might just be the first blessing might have just been the taste to see if you were hungry for more. Can I just do a little word study with you here? In verse 14, it says, as they went, they were cleansed. That Greek word there for cleansed, Ray knows this already. He could give you a, what's the word, Ray? Do you know the word for cleansed? Oh, he doesn't know the word. I can't even say it. I read it a bunch of times. I'm like, I'm going to sound like a goofball if I try saying it. But the word, the Greek word there for cleansed, what it basically meant was it was an inner and outer cleaning of the physical body. So that's what these guys wanted. They were calling out to God and saying, God, we've been hit with this leprosy. Our limbs are falling off. We need help. And God says, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were healed. They got the thing that they wanted. They were satisfied because what that meant was they could go to the priest and they no longer had to live outside the camp anymore. They no longer had to be excommunicated from their family. They could get back to work, go back to life as usual. How many of our prayers is, God, can I just get back to the place of getting by? Can I just have enough to pay this month's rent? Can I just have enough to get this thing taken care of? Instead of believing that we serve a God of more than enough, that when he's wanting to bless you, he's not wanting to just give you enough, he's wanting to bless you so that you are positioned to change the world around you. But what we find is that nine of these men were satisfied with just looking good on the outside. But then there was the one. The one that comes back and he falls on his face before the Lord, he begins to give him praise and honor, because now he has the revelation, not just of the healing, but of the healer. Now he understands that the miracle that's happening in his life is just the tip of the spear, and so there's something inside of him that says, I have to go reconnect. I have to go maintain this relationship with this one that has brought supernatural change, and it brings forth a loud praise. I'm afraid that so many times in the church we're good about getting loud about the things that we want from God and then when we get it, we're kind of like, I thank you. We just move on. And a lot of times because we're the ones that had to do something, kind of low-key, we're like, ah, I, I kind of did that. Like, ah, thank you Jesus for the air in my lungs and the ability to move my fingers. But it was really under my own strength and my own power that I pulled that off. And maybe that's what it looks like because all you got was step one. But I want, to hear, I want you to hear the word of the Lord this morning. There's more for you. There's more for you. That God does what is exceedingly abundantly above all that we could even ask or think. So the expectation is just stay in the presence of God. It's not even knowing the right things to say because the work that he's wanting to do in phase two is so much greater than what happened in phase one. It's so great that you can't ask for it. You just have to connect with the one that's going to make it happen. It's just going to happen through a daily connection. And that's what this man found as he fell on his face before the one who is the healer, the author and the finisher of our faith. He says, your faith has made you well. And I do know that word, because I grew up in a good Pentecostal church. That word there is sozo. That word there means that you're saved, that you're healed, that you're delivered, that you prosper, that you're protected, and that you are made whole. That your faith, the fact that you came back and returned to give praise, thanks, glory, and honor unto my name and for who I am. You've already gotten what you needed, but it wasn't about just what you needed. It was about connecting with the need meter. He says, now that faith, that faith has made you whole. That faith has saved your life. That faith has healed you. That faith is bringing you to a whole different level. And I just tell you, church, don't settle for a little. Some of you say, man, look what God has done. He has blessed me. And I tell you, there's more. Don't get complacent. And the final point here is the connection. It's about a relationship with Jesus. We say we're all about relationship here at the gathering that the kingdom of God is more about a relationship than it is about theology. I went and graduated Bible school twice. I love, <laughs> I love theology. Ray likes it even more than me. He was super extra and went and got his doctorate. Um, we love theology around here. Like, we're all about digging into the word of God. We want to lean into that. But if you just have the understanding of it on a book sense, but you don't actually have the relationship side of it, can I just say it's kind of worthless? Satan knows the Bible inside and out. He's literally watched the stories unfold before his eyes time and time again. So just having the knowledge is not enough. You have to have the relationship 
with God. What happened with the nine is they just wanted to get their life back. They weren't interested in the relationship. They're like, thank you, goodbye, I'll see you later. Maybe, and we can't pull this from the text, but maybe they thought, I'll give him thanks afterwards. I just want to go get what I need to get from the priest. And then once he gives me the clean bill of health, then I still got to go sit outside the camp for a couple of days, so then maybe I'll find Jesus at that point. And then I will give him thanks after I've taken care of what I want to take care of. But there was one, the Bible makes note, that he actually, before he ever went to the priest, before he ever took care of anything else, he just stopped and turned right back around and said, I got to go give thanks to the one who brought this amazing miracle in my life. And when we're talking about relationship, understand that Jesus sees this. He didn't just take note of what the one did. He also noted what the nine did. He said, where's the other ones? Just this one? And he doesn't really, it's not like he's, he's throwing shade at him, but there's a little bit of like the backhanded compliment of this dude's a Samaritan. Like Jesus made it clear, like I'm here for the Jewish people first. This guy who's not, and this is the key here, who's not entitled to anything according to their history, their heritage, their lifestyle, or anything else, finds no entitlement whatsoever. He's the one that comes back and gives me thanks. But the other nine, the implication would be, all my fellow Jews have just went off to go do their own thing to get cleansed and get on with life. Can I say a lot of times what we do is we mistake God's patience for his permission in our lives. A lot of times that we say, well, I'm getting away with the sin. I've grown numb to it. And part of the reason why is I haven't seen the effects of this sin in my life yet. God didn't strike me down as soon as I did fill in the blank, so maybe he doesn't really have a problem with this particular area. Don't mistake his patience for his permission, because Jesus saw that. He said, why is it that there was just one that returned, and the one really wasn't entitled to anything. He was just a beneficiary of being around the rest of these guys, and it is God's nature, and it is God's heart to always be the healer. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord is saved. So the response of the one was just to praise him with a loud voice. Let us not be people that just call out to God loud and walk away, but let our praise be loud. I want to ask you the question this morning as we close. Have you lost the wonder of Christ? Have you lost the wonder of your relationship? Or are you at a, at a place of first love with God where you're really ready to do just about anything? at any moment, at the drop of a hat, God, I'm not measuring out my offerings. I'm not measuring out my life. My life is completely yours. Would you mind playing piano for me? The speakers are on. <laughs> my life is completely yours. All that I am. We don't do this as just a, a way for manipulation. Music is not supposed to be used as a tool for manipulation in the kingdom of God, but it is a weapon of warfare. That when King Saul would come under attack in his palace, that what he would do, he wasn't calling for another alcoholic beverage to calm him down. He wasn't looking for some woman to bring peace into his life. What he would do is he would call upon David, who was a worshiper, to calm that spirit, to change the atmosphere. It wasn't something that could just be manipulated through emotions. There was a spiritual warfare that was taking place. And when we return to first love, what we're doing is we are partnering once again with the God who comforts us, the God who heals us. The Bible says that it is in his presence that there is fullness of joy. There is healing and there is life forevermore. I just declare over you that whom the Son is setting free, they are free indeed. You are free from your past. I want to declare that the blessing is so much greater than the curse. The generations are numbered for the curse but the blessing will go out into eternity. That today we stand in joy and in favor because of the blessing that Abraham received. God, I thank you for being more than enough. I thank you for being my provider. I thank you for being all that I need. Just declare over you, Romans 1, verse 16 Paul says that I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First the Jew and then the Gentile. God, let us be a people of boldness that can say, like Paul said, that I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed to be a follower of Christ. I'm not ashamed. Come on, can you stand your feet with me? Let's begin to talk to God. I'm not ashamed to be one that says, I serve the one true living God, that his word is not only the lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path, but it is the absolute truth. When this world tries to reject truth, Lord God, we call upon the plumb line of your word to be the absolute 
absolute truth that brings balance to all things, that carries all power and all authority as we declare it with boldness and we declare it with strength. Let us be a people that say, I am not ashamed to say that Jesus Christ is the one and only way that no man comes to God except through you, Lord Jesus, because it's when we begin to live and declare that truth that lives are changed. We will not see the fulfillment of your promise, Lord God, until we are a people who choose to be bold enough to partner with your word. We cannot just be passive. That Sunday mornings are not the be-all to end-all, but this is just the fuel in the tank for today to get us going into Monday. And then what we experience on Monday carries us over until Tuesday, but it's not enough for Tuesday. It's just the starting point once again. And then we connect with you on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and we're living a life that's connecting with you and that the thing that this world wants is an authentic relationship with Christ. They don't want religion because it just kills, it deceives, it brings confusion, oppression, and sadness in their life. And we got plenty of that. Everything else around us offers that. But God, only you carry the words of life. Only you bring peace. Only you bring joy. God, can I go as far as just to declare there is no love apart from the love of the Father. That the love that this world calls love is only a lie. There's only a second hand coming in and always reaching and wanting to take in the midst of the giving. But God, you alone, you give pure and perfect love. Let your love reign supreme in our lives. Let it overflow into the world around us. And once they've tasted and seen of the goodness of God, they just come back for more and more. Let us be the one that is always giving thanks, giving praise unto your name, Lord God. We love you. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, if you guys are in this room this morning, that's good, give them praise. If you guys are in this room this morning, you say, I need to return back to that first love. I need to come back to that place of that relationship with God where it's so thick and so passionate, so honest that I'm willing to do anything for God. Maybe you've never actually made the decision to follow Christ. Maybe you went through a couple little prayers here and there, but honestly, there's never any heart change. There's never any life change. Yeah, I went to the camp, and the youth pastor was really good, and he got me to pray this prayer, but to be honest, when I came back the next day, there was nothing different. There was nothing that changed. I was still striving. I was still fighting towards my own propensities, my own failures, my own struggles. If you guys are ready for an authentic relationship with God, I'm going to invite you to pray this simple prayer with me. If you're watching online, Wherever you are right now, I want to tell you that Holy Spirit knows no bounds. Our prayers are not limited just here to prosper. You guys understand that these videos and stuff we send out, we don't just do it as a ritual thing, but there's literally people all around the nation that kick back and watch this stuff. And it's not to give praise or glory to any of us, but it's honestly just to say that the Word of God is going forth and it's bigger than any one person. And so if you want to connect with the one that we so desperately love, that we want to be close to. I want to invite you just to pray the simple prayer with me. Let's just call out on his name. Say, Jesus, I am in need of a Savior. I recognize that in my sin I cannot help myself. That the wages of my sin will be ultimate death. So God, I look to you as my help and as my Savior. I acknowledge that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He rose again three days later. And that through him, I made a child of God. Jesus, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for these who have declared this maybe for the first time or in this moment, just in an authentic way saying, God, you have my heart, you have my life. I surrender all that I am to you. Lord Jesus, I just ask that you continue the work in their life. Just declare over you that he he who has begun the good work sees it through until the end. The blessing is yours. The relationship is yours. Take it and own it now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We love you guys.